Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmony Of liberty My pleasure to announce or to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Dr. Karen J. Gibson is an associate professor in the Nohad A. Toulon School of Urban Studies and Planning at Portland State University. Her scholarship seeks to answer questions about the political economy of racial economic inequality in the urban setting. Her publications have appeared in Cities, Feminist Economics, Transforming Anthropology, the Journal of Planning, Education, and Research, and the Oregon Historical Quarterly, an article that she co-authored with Leanne Cervelo about relations between the community and the police in the Albina neighborhood in the mid-1960s to the mid-1980s, was the winner of our Joel Palmer Award and is available online at ohs.org. So check it out and read it if you haven't, or if it's been a few years, you might want to revisit that and check it out. Uh, she also teaches courses in housing and community development, and most importantly, she is a member of the OHQ Editorial Advisory Board. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Karen Gibson. We have these bright lights on our speaker because we're recording tonight's program, so it'll be up on the OHS website and you can watch it again. But meanwhile, she suffers. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, good evening. Thank you so much for coming uh, tonight uh, on this wonderfully warm and unusually uh, nice evening in Portland. Uh, thank you, Eliza, Karen, and to McMinimans for um, inviting me here, and um, I'm really happy to be here. Okay, how's everyone? Okay, I hope you've got your notepads because I've got a homework assignment for you. All right. Let me get started. I have a, a, a number of slides here that I want to go through, and then we'll take some question and, questions and answers. Uh, let me see if I can manage these bright lights. All right. Portland's Black Belt, Motives and Means in Albina Real Estate, 1940 to 1990. Okay, here's an overview of my talk. Oh, I think I don't I stand still. All right. Um, here's a conceptual overview of my talk. Uh, this is something that I'm currently, you know, I continue to work on, and uh, so. I am trying to get across to you tonight some of the conceptual notions actually behind segregation and how the real estate industry implements social relations, social power relations of, of, of white supremacy. And so how does it occur that, that, that a social relation becomes embedded in the built environment? And once it's in the built environment, of course, we know it perpetuates itself. And so it has us today with segregation, acting, economic inequality, racial economic inequality, and uh, impacting social relations and, and uh, the well-being of people in our society. Okay, so I'm going to go over the study area. I hope some of you have read Bleeding Albina. Some of this is a will be, for those of you who haven't, or maybe haven't looked at it in a long time, this will just refresh us as to what the area is I'm talking about. I'm gonna show you some maps that, that trace the changing geography of, of the black settlement from 1940 to 1990. I'll go over the motives for racial residential segregation in terms of social relations and then in terms of uh, real estate and the commercial interests involved. And then I'm going to talk briefly about uh, some of the instances of, of financial exploitation that have occurred when an area is ghettoized and disinvested. 
because it is redlined does not mean that there's no lending going on. There is lending, but it's just predatory and some subprime lending. Okay, so some of the means by which this occurs, I'll show you some cases of discrimination in the Portland area. I am going to focus, I mean this, I'm covering 50 year period here, so I am going to hone in on the 1940s, early 1940s when World War II migrant workers came. Blacks and whites, over 100,000 people came and blacks were segregated in the area of Albina which had already been des designated as the place for African Americans to live. And there was a clash that occurred in, in the fall of 1942 uh, and there was some testimony in front of city council that I am going to share with you that shows you the role of residents and their perceptions about integration at the time. And okay, uh, and then I'm going to talk about the financial exploitation uh, of buyers and renters, uh, blacks and whites, people who lived in the Albina district, and uh, Lincoln Loan and Dominion Capital were two 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 agencies, <laughs> two enterprises that um, helped to um, prey upon people trying to purchase or rent homes in the area. And I'll click. Conclude. Okay, here's the study area. From 19, you see that on the left is, uh, or the the western boundary is I-5. The eastern boundary is about 22nd there in that shaded area. What I did when I decided on this, picking this particular area of Albina, as I said, which neighborhoods or census tracts as proxy for neighborhoods, which neighborhoods were 35 percent black? or more in 1970. These are the areas that turned out to be the same as the model cities area during that time. So it includes several neighborhoods. Can everybody, can you read the map back there? It's probably too small. Well, it includes there from the Lloyd District, if you see that asterisk on the bottom, the southernmost district, that big asterisk point is where Memorial Coliseum is. If you look straight up, you see the H for Emmanuel Hospital. That's the Lloyd District neighborhood, the Elliott neighborhood. To the right of Elliott is Irvington. On top of that is Sabin, King. To the left, Boise, Humboldt on top of it. And then to the right of King in the middle is part of Vernon. And up on the top, bordering Columbia Boulevard is uh, Woodland neighborhood. I'm sorry, Woodlawn neighborhood. Okay, so if you can read what I've got up here, the white population declined by half during the 50s as blacks were moving in. You know, we had a, a, a telephone. <laughs> okay, the white population declined by half in the 50s as people moved out of inner northeast Portland. Um, and by 1960, 80% of the black population lived in northeast, in this Albina district. There was about 12,500 people. It became highly segregated with 80% of all black Portlanders in this area. Actually, in the 40s, the area consisted, and I'll show you a map, it, uh, the, just above the H there on the left is Fremont Boulevard going across east-west. The, the initial area was really this, just this two-mile long, one-mile wide district uh, where about 11 or 12,000 people were crammed into. It was very extremely crowded. Uh, but in 1970, as an indicator of segregation, the Boise neighborhood had, was 84% black, okay? Um, and then in 1990, my period that ends what I'm covering today, uh, it, it still remained 57% black and 38% white as, and 5% other, and as we know, this has changed. Okay. Um, I just want to overview the disinvestment processes. We had housing speculation, slumlordism, bank redlining, predatory lending, which filled the void of redlining. Can you read this in the back? Okay. Absentee ownership, Albina as a vice district. Uh, one of the, uh, some of the ministers would go down to the mayor in the early 60s and say, help us with the crime and the drugs and the prostitution. 
and the police chief would say, oh, it's okay, it's, it's confined to the albina, so it's okay, we don't need to do anything about it. And, uh, and then these different forms of urban redevelopment and renewal that led to displacement. So there's Memorial Coliseum, Emanuel Hospital, Lloyd District, Portland Public School Headquarters, the Water Bureau, and the Highways 599 and 405. All of these redevelopment efforts forced members of the Abina District to move and move again. Often many people move more, you know, two, three, four times. Uh, I have a little quote there showing, this shows Russell and Williams Avenue in 1962. And then the bottom picture shows it in 2007. I took that photo. And you, as you can see, the, the same corner had still not been developed by Emanuel Hospital. And the quote says, they took the heart out of this community. It was our little area. That's Shamsa Din. Okay, now I'm gonna show you some maps of how the area was reshaped. Uh, the black population in Portland from 1940 to 1990. Here's the first one. If you can see, uh, there's Broadway Boulevard is the bottom straight line here, and Fremont is the top straight line across. Again, it's the same area. This is where I'm talking about in 1940. Albina consisted of this area to the west of Williams Avenue and up to Fremont. Really, blacks were confined to the area between Oregon Street on the south, which was the, where the steel bridge and the Broadway Bridge, okay? And people were pushed over from uh, Old Town, Northwest Portland um, during the uh, Great Depression. So I want you to pay attention. This is 1940 black population was no more than five to 10%. This is before the war migration. Uh, there's about 1,100 African Americans in that area, but I want you to pay attention to the to the uh, little legend I have at the top because those figures will change. And so this will just go on a quick journey of population change. 1950, people are living. We've had between 1940 and 50 Vanport born and died, right? So it doesn't show up on this map at all. And what you see there on the left, that huge area, that huge polygon, people aren't living all up and down there, but that's where uh, Giles Lake was located, right? Where about 5,000 blacks were uh, segregated into that housing project. And we're still there when the 1950 census was taken. Shortly after the end of the year, that Giles Lake is reclaimed for industrial use and people are moved or squeezing into Albina. Actually, between 1940 and 1950, many, many African Americans left. More African Americans left Portland than did they leave San Francisco or Seattle uh, because it was clear that the job prospects were gonna be very dim and um, it was clear that there was a lot of hostility to, to people remaining. So as you can see, the darker shades are 25 to 50 percent black. The, okay, and then this this other like little hand that's up there, the little it looks like a little I don't know robot. Uh, that's Swan Island, okay, industrial area. So after the flood, people were put there too, okay. Now we'll go to. 1960, and as you can see, you're getting, you see the legend shows the darkest innermost part. People are funneled, channeled into this highly dense, crowded housing conditions so that those darker areas are 50 to 75% black, okay? And as you can see, there's no, you know, many areas surrounding, nothing, no, no African American population in Southeast Portland. So there's tight, this is one way of seeing segregation. Here you can see 1970, you have Memorial Coliseum, as well as some of the freeway and other uh, urban renewal that have reduced population in these areas here. 
but these areas are 50 to 85% black. So this is one Boise neighborhood right here is 85% black, okay? So over there where SEI is now, all right? 1980, you still have this solid block of segregation. And you start to see a little bit of expansion by 1990. All right, so that's, that's a visual representation of segregation. Now I'm gonna to turn to the role of the real estate industry, uh, which consists of developers, realtors, bankers, appraisers, title companies, insurance companies, landlords, building inspectors, residents. I'm, how many of you have heard of J.C. Nichols? Oh, nobody. Oh, well, he is a very, very, he was a very influential person. In fact, the Urban Land Institute today gives a J.C. Nichols Award because he's considered one of the most successful subdivision developers in the United States. He developed the Kansas City Country Club District, if anybody knows that, the first uh, automobile plaza shopping center, okay? This is, a, I, he has a lovely speech that he gave in 1937 where he, I've taken some quotes from it. Cities are handmade, whether physically good or physically bad is our responsibility. If we simply serve as a medium for the mere barter of real estate, then we are not a profession. So you'll see from the quotes that I've selected from this speech, why I am in real estate, illustrate why it was important to segregate and use legal means and organize bodies of residents as well as developers to control the flow of people in and out of a residential development, okay, for the purpose of creating a beautiful community according to uh, this vision of what a beautiful community was, which was white and homogeneous. Okay, uh, J.C. Nichols, when he first got started in real estate, left Kansas and went to ride his bike around Europe, and he fell in love with the beautiful English uh, countryside villages, okay? And so he, he, he saw how the village people lived in their same houses for decades and decades and decades, even hundreds of years. And he, he wanted, and he, he, it contrasted greatly with the kind of hodgepodge development that he saw in the United States, which often considered, consisted of not just class diversity, racial and ethnic diversity, but land use diversity, you know, warehouses and, and, and industrial uses and commercial uses all mixed together. And he, but he wanted to create a better environment. So here's some of the lessons that, that he was giving in his speech. Getting rid of the hog yard, dairy farm, and Negro Park, although it loaded us heavily with carrying charges, was valuable in pointing out another cardinal principle in land development, the necessity of controlling large areas to give proper to protection to buyers and retain the accruing values for yourself. So the notion is you, in order to to retain property values, you have to control development around you. Okay, so if you build a residential development, you have to make sure there's no industry, there's no hog farms, hog yards, or especially in another part of this speech, he calls it a Negro razor park. You, you have to make sure that you're controlling what's around you spatially, okay? to protect value into the future. Because what he saw in England was that you needed to protect values, you know, 50, 100 years into the future in perpetuity, okay? And this is why you had to control a large amount of space and that's why he had to borrow money to buy lots of land. Because he had experimented with doing developments and then other, you know, a hog farm would move in and his, all his value would go downhill, right? Kind of like not in my backyard. Right? Okay. Another lesson for creating protected com communities. Our first mistake was to sell without restrictions and then with very meager control for only 10 year periods. 
Later, it cost us thousands of dollars to repurchase certain lots to bring about a universal extension of proper protective restrictions. Extending over long periods with our self-perpetuating provisions. So space and time, and now the people. We had soon learned that it was unwise merely to place restrictions on each lot as it was sold and establish the practice from which we have never varied of filing our restriction covenants with the recording of our plat, binding upon the developers and the buyers. These restrictions should be a prior covenant to any mortgage on the land. So as you, restrictive covenants, people have to join in, you have to get like 70 5% of the people who are going into a subdivision to agree to restrict it. Usually it will say no Negroes or Jews or whoever, you know, foreigners that they didn't want in, right, that can, can buy into this land. The other thing that uh, J.C. Nichols is credited with innovating is the Homeowners Association, okay, because as long as he got the, the residents, the buyers, to buy in and be proactive to guarding the restrictions, right, and making sure that others didn't move in, then uh, it would help perpetuate the segregation, right? It would help keep the property values up and the protections up. So uh, these subdivisions would be designated as restricted on the sign, and, and people would buy into them expecting that the area would be contr controlled because uh, with this notion of, of, of African Americans and others bringing down property values, uh, if a few people moved in, that might cause the triple, trickle effect, right, the domino effect, and it would, whites would leave if just a few moved in. In fact, at Levittown, you've heard of Levittown, there's one on Long Island, one in Pennsylvania, uh, William Levitt, or I think it's William, he said he wasn't personally prejudiced, but that if he sold one home, there were 17,000 houses on the Long Island Levittown. If he sold one home to a Negro, then uh, 90 to 95% of his white buyers would not buy in. So this, for some of these realty folks, these developers, was considered a financial imperative, right, to keep these places segregated. So segregation is built into the economy of real estate. Okay, and it, and it still has major influence. Here's a poem to lighten up our... <laughs> Langston Hughes, when I move into a neighborhood, folks fly. Even every foreigner that can move, moves. Why? The moon doesn't run, neither does the sun. In Chicago, they've got covenants restricting me. Hemmed in on the south side, can't breathe free. But the wind blows there. I reckon the wind must care. This is a photograph from a 1963 performance at the YWCA, the Young Women's Christian Association. In, 19, in 1963, and so <laughs> I use this picture. I'm sorry, it's not funny, but it is funny. Um, does everybody know what blackface is, right? This, this is a, a white woman with putting blackface on. So at this time, she felt that it was, Um, this is what was going on. So I just used this uh, to show the state of race relations in 1960s Portland. Uh, I call it unenlightened, to put it nicely, okay? Because this is, you know, highly offensive. And it was offensive in the 20s, much less in the 60s, okay? But it just shows that in Portland, because the state's 1% black, and the 5% uh, of African Americans that lived in, Port in, in uh, Portland in 1960 were all confined to a certain area, and you can go through most of Portland, probably 80% of it, and not ever see any African Americans. This was something that was, you know, indicative of, you know, to me, Oregon is kind of like a lost state that floated over from the south over to the northwest, because actually a lot of the people 
that came here were from the South, okay? And we were born during the time of the debates over the expansion of slavery. So this has, uh, you know, us having the only exclusion of African Americans in our Constitution that was uh, at that time. I mean, other states were writing this in, but I think we were foremost in one way or another of, of really emphasizing black exclusion, exclusion of free blacks. And um, so I just show that as a kind of uh, an example of how people were thinking as we're going to go through some of the, uh, the incidents I told you about in the 1940s. Here's a little bit more humor. I love this quote, but it shows you the power of real estate. I got off the bus one day in Scarsdale by accident, and in the 15 minutes it took me to catch another bus, the property values dropped by 50%. <laughs> I don't blame people for not wanting us to live in their neighborhood, because we have a very high crime rate. All the big criminals are colored. Al Capone was colored. John Dillinger was colored. How many of you remember Godfrey Cambridge? Yeah, uh, brilliant man. He was here in, in 1964. Uh, so this is the case I was telling you about in 1942 where uh, there was a proposed, people in East Portland community, which East Portland is anything on this side of the river at that point in time, uh, were, were, there were rumors that a uh, housing development was going to be put uh, in on Flint and Russell Street, okay, that would well, house uh, some of the black male war workers that had recently arrived, okay, to work in the shipyards and in the war industries. So um, these are some quotes from testimony at City Council on October 7, 1942, from John Day, uh, representative of the East. Portland Community Club. He says, we do resent this effort to infiltrate our neighborhood with these transients. The great majority of colored people in that neighborhood next to the railroad bridge are just as fine as any you can find, but we do object to them spreading over the district. Okay, and here is Reverend Albert Riddick uh, reading from a petition on behalf of several hundreds of citizens against the proposed Negro housing on Flint and Russell, same day, October 7, 1942. To deliberately plant a colony of Negroes in the midst of a white community is to deny the very foundations of that freedom and equality of which the Negro and his quantum friends so misguidedly prate. The truth is the Negro needs to learn to make himself worthy of the white companionship he craves. Until he does, segregation will be practiced by white people in some form in very self-defense. For the presence of Negroes in a community means inescapable property devaluation. Okay, so it looks like um, the efforts of John Nichols have worked out, right, when real estate at the top wants to, well, and it, it, you know, wants to have everybody believe that Negroes actually uh, bring property values down or other people of color will bring property values down, people are buying into it. It's not a reality, it's a subjective thing though, isn't it? So that it becomes a reality, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy if whites are gonna move out any time that uh, blacks move in, they say property values just go down. It's not true uh, uh, in, objectively, but it's a, it's a subjective truth that whites being the dominant group with the power, right, with the money power, and being the major portion of the population, their vote, they can vote with their feet and uh, cause those that are in this industry to make money, to lose money, and therefore they want to abide by these things, okay? But people seem to believe this. I mean, this particular quote is interesting to me because Albert Riddick, Reverend Riddick, talks about uh, the freedom to be free from African Americans in his neighborhood, okay? That was, it was a violation of their democratic rights. 
Okay, so it's a, it's a matter of both a side, and then the notion of being worthy, this is my evidence, this is what illustrates the notion that there is a social hierarchy, right, a racial hierarchy that's being imposed here, okay? But Mrs. Minnie Martin Shank was more positive. She's a white woman who wrote a letter to Mayor Riley about this issue. As to the suggested housing project on Flint Avenue, I would be emphatically opposed to undesirable neighbors of any race or color. But as to colored persons as such, judging from my experience with them, I would not be opposed to them at all. I found them good neighbors and good citizens. So as today, you see that there's varying opinion in the white community about the notion of integration. Here's a, uh, a response to this article in the Oregonian about, that appeared on September 23rd about this worry of Negro influx. And Dr. Unthank, who had been brought here to, to care for the health of black uh, people because uh, medicine was segregated, um, was a leader who spoke out. He wrote, the worry to the city is the prejudice in its heart, the unfairness to a group of people who are coming to Portland to do their part, however small. We are fighting a war that democracy might live. When, I ask you, are we going to make an honest, fair, and manly beginning at home? My appeal is to all the fair-minded citizens of Portland. I ask that we stop creating a black belt in Portland. Rent and sell these people homes where they can afford to buy them. Accept these people as citizens of Portland, worthy of the same respect as any other group of incoming people. And here I wanted to give you an example of the mayor's uh, response to the increase in the black population because uh, Mayor Riley was quite a character uh, who uh, had something to say about this. And actually, some of what I'm leaving out is, is that, that there was a, a, a police hysteria. They were really over-arresting African-Americans who had moved here. And uh, part of what Dr. Unthank wrote in his uh, letter to the editor that I just quoted from was that, um, uh, he, he sees patients and he didn't see any more criminality in his selection of black patients as he did white patients, okay? But there was this hysteria and this criminalization of the newcomers. And you'll see uh, Mayor Riley's tone here. Mayor Riley stated that the settlement of most Negro newcomers, Negro newcomers in Albina had created a serious problem in as much as Portland can only absorb a minimum of Negroes without upsetting the city's regular life. We must be tolerant and considerate, but we must as well be firm. Undesirables, white or colored, are not wanted, and if they fail to obey our laws, will be unceremoniously dealt with. So here's Reverend J.J. Clow from Mount Olivet Baptist Church, who went down to testify himself against this group that was petitioning for the Flint uh, housing development uh, not to be built there. The Negroes in Portland have already been restricted so that housing conditions for Negroes in this city have been for a number of years very undesirable because any community in which they tried to move they have the same sort of thing you have here this morning. Let them be doctors, lawyers, or whatever. There is always a protest. So here's just an example of uh, home buyers who had faced a lot of rejection and trying to buy a home. In March of 1955, this uh, Navy man and his family couldn't rent, couldn't buy, a home. they had money to purchase a home and couldn't, were being rejected over and over again. They didn't understand it. They called themselves respectable, they had the money. And they, every time they went to find a house, the realty group would, um, steer them toward an industrial area, right? So they wanted to buy in a suburban area. So this made the paper, this is from the Oregonian. But I know you, you, you can't read the text there, sorry about that. Um, 
what I want to show there is the Portland Realty Board. The president is saying that uh, about the problem of George Hunter trying to find a home, uh, that 360 realtors in his organization have a code of ethics which prevents them from selling houses in white districts, districts to colored people without the consent of neighbors. He says, the majority of the people in Portland are prejudiced against having Negroes for neighbors, therefore moving a Negro into a neighborhood where the residents don't want him would damage the value of the surrounding property. Payne quoted the quote, the code as saying, a realtor shall never be instrumental in introducing a neighborhood character or into a neighborhood, a character or property occupancy, members of any race or nationality of any individuals whose presence will clearly be detrimental to the property values in the neighborhood. And we know that this discrimination happened to the Asian Americans in town, Native Americans, other groups, Jewish would have trouble, okay, people by religion, so people uh, were prejudiced that way. But the point I wanna make is, I want you to think about real estate. They're organized nationally, and they ha right. Uh, they have their national association of real real estate boards, and then they have local affiliates. And people in communities, like the ones protesting uh, the Flint dormitory, uh, would also organize and say that they wouldn't give a realtor any business if that realtor introduced somebody into their neighborhood. So I just want you to know that how can people fight against something that's so organized? I mean, the reason I got involved in this study was that I had already been, you know, my initial interest was black poverty and inequality. And I used to focus more on economic development. And then I got into the spatial aspects and into the housing aspects. But I had studied Detroit and Pittsburgh, much larger cities when I first got started. And then when I came to Portland, I saw that there was a teeny tiny ghetto <laughs> Uh, and so my question was, how does this phenomenon repeat itself in city after city after city after city, even when you would think there would be a tiny black population, so why should it be a threat, okay? But you can see that there is a role for organized groups in perpetuating this because they have this financial in interest. It is their business, okay? So they're taking what it should be some social relations, race relations, is racial hierarchy in our society, and they're embedding it into the built environment for these reasons of uh, both to ensure that the social hierarchy remains the same, to ensure property values, right, it's, it's connected to wealth development, as well as uh, one thing that I do not have time to get into, but of course I'm sure many of you know, is the interest in not having integration, not having miscegenation, okay? Not having any racial mixing going on. Uh, if children would grow up in the same neighborhoods, they might not realize that they're supposed to be, that they're different, right? Also, I think another reason for maintaining African Americans and other people of color in dilapidated neighborhoods is that it helps reinforce the notion of inferiority, okay? Now I'm transitioning into just some of the urban renewal. I uh, showed, uh, we, there's segregation, okay? So people are segregated. You got 80% of the black population living in this area by 1960. Here is a 1955 housing quality study, right? 10 years after the population has increased because of the war, three or four years after Vanport is flooded, you know, four or five, right? Five, six years after Vanport is flooded and many people are segregated into the Albina district, you have all of a sudden, bingo, substandard housing in the area where African Americans live. So this 1955 housing quality study, um, Broadway Steel Bridge area, found that 58% of the housing there was substandard. So here's the map, can you see that? And then here is the the, what you see is the Memorial Coliseum, and that, about 40, whoops, about 46 percent of the population that was uh, moved out for this development was African American, and there were 476 homes destroyed. Okay, and what I want to show you here is just a chart. You really don't have to, you know, we can't really see, you can't really see the detail of this, but 
The point I have in putting it here is to show that the, this is a, a, a page out of the Central Albina study, which had been commissioned around 1960, just as they were finished with bulldozing Elliott neighborhood for Memorial Coliseum, the city got to work on the Emanuel Hospital area. So in 1962, this report was commissioned by the Planning Bureau. And the, this is a chart of housing dilapidation. So the darker squares that you might be able to make out way, way back there are 50 to 100% dilapidation. The next shaded area is 20 to 49% dilapidation. So you can see the freeway here. And this is, uh, I can't even see this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is inner northeast, the Elliott area uh, is, is being targeted for actually rezoning into industrial. This report predicted or it recommended that the area not even be industrial. Okay, so where a lot of, where some of you may live today, this was supposed to be just completely wiped out, okay, and made industrial. So Williams Avenue is up here somewhere. I, I can't even see this myself, sorry. <laughs> okay, so this chart comes from the Portland Planning Commission in 1967. I have two charts. One of them shows the blight core. You see this dark area? This is the blighted area. As you can see, it is the same shape as my map of Albina, the Albina district where the, most of the black population is living in 1967. Um, and then this area is the blight-free area, which was more of a middle-class black district and the Albina Neighborhood Improvement Association actually got money from the Portland Development Commission to do some improvements in that area. But I show this because I want you to see the thinking on behalf of the city and urban renewal planners, you know, across the country about how uh, blight, which is housing dilapidation, and of course in that ho substandard housing study, one of the items on the survey that inspectors did is of course ask about race. Okay, what percentage race, what race were the people in the houses that they looked at to determine whether they were substandard. So blight is substandard housing, it might be older, this shows that uh, they're, they're worried about blight spreading. And the next chart will show you the, what urban renewal does, which is to confine and attack blight so that it doesn't spread. Urban renewal is an effective strategy of confining the blight problem by encirclement around, along with a direct attack on the core. Although, <laughs> so this reminds me of actually circling the wagons or, or yeah. Uh, actually, what's funny is that you know, when you demolish an area, people have to move to somewhere else, so I'm not sure about confining it. How to combine, okay, so now I'm moving on to um, probably the last third of this presentation, a few more slides that deal with uh, the issue of blight. I, I showed you that there was a lot of disinvestment, a lot of redlining going on, um, housing is older, there's a, there was a lot of poverty. Uh, people, even if you have the money though, you, it's difficult to get access to loans that are conventional mortgages that are of good, on good terms. You're often subject to predatory loans. And actually, I think the out movement of the white population was so great, which with about 20, 22,000 people moving out in the 50s, the black population that replaced it was never large enough to to take over all that housing. And so I think that that even in and of itself contributed to housing abandonment that you start to see. So how else do you combat quote unquote blight without just bulldozing everything, okay? Planners wanted to create new things and they bulldozed uh, the old to come in with the new. Uh, but many folks were against that kind of renovation. And we eventually, after the Albina area kind of went downhill so that by 1990, the city, the median home value in Albina was two thirds that of the city median, okay? It was about 39,000 in 1990 in the Albina district compared to I think 58 
in the city as a whole, okay, in 1990. So how could you have preserved that area? What are the means for maintaining housing stock? And eventually the city got with it in the early 90s after this, this area hit rock bottom with disinvestment in around 1988. And, uh, residents clamoring at the city, knocking at the door for decades, asking for them, the city to help do building code enforcement, help keep up our neighborhoods. Uh, they got little help and there was a lot of neglect. They finally started to get some attention when, when Bud Clark ran for mayor in 1988. Okay, but here I wanna share with you, if you can see this, um, the three principal weapons over a housing stock. So this is just generic urban housing 101 about how to uh, preserve housing. So if you don't execute these things, you will have problems. The three weapons over the housing stock, you know, how do you maintain a healthy housing stock is to have a number one, mortgage financing, number two, building code enforcement, and number three, tax policy. But since in Albina, conventional banks redline the district, uh, this was helped contribute to dilapidation. Uh, they often just cited old housing, mixed land use, small, and that the loans are too small to make any money on. Okay, building code enforcement, the Bureau of Health and Bureau of Buildings were grossly understaffed and unconcerned with blight, according to the City Club report of 1957. And in 1978, in a 1978 review, council member Charles Jordan found the same problem, okay? So the city hadn't been paying attention. As a matter of fact, in the period 1950 to 1970, excuse me, I need a break. <laughs> you probably do too. Okay, a little more. All right, so tax policy. Assessments, you know, abatements. In the period of 1950 to 74, Portland had the highest tax delinquency, fifth highest tax delinquency in the nation after Chicago, Houston, Boston, and Newark. Did you know that? Non-payment, and here's a, whoops, geez, so sensitive. Not, this is a quote from uh, Robert Lake's uh, book, Real Estate Tax Delinquency. He's a professor at Rutgers. He says, non-payment of real estate taxes is evidence of a breakdown in the relationship between the public and private sector in the American city. So he was studying tax delinquency and found that we were way behind, okay? Um, there was a lot of disinvestment in a lot of areas, not just Al in Albina, uh, that people were, had tax foreclosures. By 1990, I think uh, Multnomah County had more than a 500 uh, foreclosed properties on its book. So here's just some stats that show um, the gradual decline in housing conditions um, and what the city finally did to enforce building codes. So we had Gradual increase in substandard housing from a third in Albina in 1960 to half in 1970. There were 541 vacant houses counted in inner Northeast Portland in 1988. Uh, one of the heroes of the African American community or of the Albina community as a whole was Edna Robertson and Jetty Portis who went around and counted all these vacant and abandoned buildings for this task force at the city. There was a lot of abandonment in Buckman as well. Um, I mentioned the median housing value was two-thirds of the city value. And then by 1991, the city got active with Gretchen Kafori, took over the Housing Bureau, and she was always the champion of low-income folks and, and uh, started, and she lived in Irvington, and she uh, started to um, work on some of the scandalous groups that were operating in Albina the Dominion Capital and uh, Dirty Dozen code violators. They had some code violators that were, they called the Dirty Dozen because of the num great numbers of uh, neglected housing they owned. So here, you probably can't even see this in the back. This may be way too small for you. But what this is, is I have quotes from the City Council Resolution of 1991. 
where the city council decided to buy the declining properties in North and Northeast Portland. And this is an unusual step for a city to take to actually socialize some of the abandoned housing, the, the housing that had been subject to these fraudulent operators. And so, whereas Dominion Capital holds title to or has financial interest in numerous residential properties in low and moderate income neighborhoods in North and Northeast Portland, they had about 350 single family homes, and this helped depress the area, right? I mean, North and Northeast Portland was kept as a place just for vulturing, really, by the real estate industry. Realtors would advise, don't buy to live there only by to speculate, okay? So uh, because there's no conventional lending, this meant that it was free form, wild west, for the other part of real estate, the one that we don't talk about a whole lot, right? The one that's not in your real estate textbook. But all you gotta do is turn on the TV and you can watch fortunes and flipping, right? And we were all subject to predation and subprime lending with the last housing crisis. Okay, so this is my evidence that people were subject to financial exploitation. The next phrase is, whereas significant financial damage may face innocent families who have purchased properties in good faith from Dominion Capital, whereas low-income North and Northeast Portland neighborhoods suffer from lack of attention to community issues from absentee landlords, and whereas the bankruptcy court is interested in a proposal which will mitigate injury to persons who have purchased property from Dominion Capital on unusual terms. The proposal is to buy the declining properties because Dominion Capital went bankrupt, okay? They were convicted of fraud and went to jail, the two principals, okay? After the Oregonian had released its report, Blueprint for a Slum, which exposed them to the public which was actually, um, what's the word, um, instigated by community activists in the Portland Organizing Project, which was a group of faith-based people who were sick and tired of redlining. And they organized to use the Community Reinvestment Act to go after banks, like I think it's, okay, First Pacific, or I think was one of the ones that was accused of not lending in the area, okay. So this is the turning point, this is the pivot point, this is the end of the decline, and of course, as you know, after the 90s, we saw reinvestment and, and, and gentrification uh, as banks were shamed into greenlining the area. Another form of exploitation was by Lincoln Loan, who was a broker, a lender, and a landlord, one of the dirty dozen top slumlords with building code violations, company owned more than 200 properties in, <laughs> inner northeast, many in deplorable condition. About 110 fixer-upper homes were sold with land sales contracts to folks who could not get loans elsewhere, right? So there's a dual housing market. If you're living in Albina, you can't get a loan, right? There was that story of the man who could buy a $26,000 car but couldn't get a loan for a $16,000 house. You also had the statement by Aura Hart, which I use in Bleeding Albina. She's a black realtor who worked in this area for many years when you could buy a house for $10,000, but people could get, not get a loan because the banks would say that's too small of a loan, the house is too old, okay? So people who live there could not, many of them, although the home ownership rate was about 45%, and actually, as of not too long ago, for African Americans 65 and older, the home ownership rate was 65% in about 2010. Okay, but it's the newer generation that couldn't get into housing, into ownership. But what Lincoln did is that he didn't record the, the land sales contracts, right, to the title companies. So if uh, the city wants to go after these uh, speculators who are, you know, you, you, in other words, even the owner, you couldn't even tell ownership, okay, if they want to go after the code violators or their houses are falling apart. You can't even tell who owns. Many buyers were defrauded out of their home with tricky legalese in the contract. Lincoln Loan would sell the houses that were in most deplorable state, also offer the buyers a rehab, 
loan, so they'd fix it up. And then sometimes if they try to sell, they find out they didn't really own it. Because I even testified for, for a couple who was divorcing and was trying to sell their home and found out they didn't own it because of this uh, locked-in contract. Eventually, they won. Uh, when I testified, the judge still said, well, they should have known better. Okay, conclusion. Yay! This is not the entire conclusion, but it's a good conclusion. It's the best conclusion. It's the best conclusion you'll ever see. <laughs> Mind you, someone? Okay. Uh, <laughs> It's better than chocolate ice cream or cake. Okay, segregation, ghettoization, disinvestment, and ex economic exploitation processes have structured racial economic inequality in place and among people. The real estate industry, pra real estate industry practices played a major role, aided and abetted by citizens and government. And this is true across the country, right? It explains what we see across the country. Black and Latina wealth in the latest housing crash of 2010, 2007 to 10, declined by two thirds, okay? Black and the Pew Research Center documented that. For somebody who teaches community development, our goal has been to increase home ownership as a way of increasing wealth, right? Because, and reducing the disparity in wealth because that's where the most common form of wealth development what does this mean? We're gone backwards. For me, it means that the techniques, there's just too much profit to be made. And the techniques honed in dual housing markets in confined and segregated places, right? Uh, they've kind of exploded. There's so much profit to be made. Part of the reason I wanted to do this though is because it really annoys me when people are outside of these neighborhoods and they, it, you know, people get, think that the reason these neighborhoods are dilapidated is because of the people that live there. When these banking practices, these real estate practices are so invisible, right? We, but because of this kind of thing going on and continuing to go on, I, my conclusion is that there's a, a need to rethink housing provision in the United States. Isn't that the best? conclusion you ever saw. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, I think we're gonna have a, an announcement from um, um, Dr. Croft about a study she is doing and then we'll uh, open it up for questions and answers, okay? Thank you, that was a really uh, fascinating talk. Good evening everyone, my name is Raina Croft. I am Assistant Professor of Neurology at Oregon Health and Science University, and I am a native of Portlander. I'm a graduate of Grant High, class of whatever. <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Maya Walker. I am a PSU student um, working up at OHSU with Dr. Kauf um, on a study that she's getting ready to explain to you guys. And Maya is about to be a Howard graduate student as well. <laughs> so together we are working on the SHARP walking program. This is a new study that's funded by the Alzheimer's Association and it is so we know that walking and we know that being socially engaged is really good for uh, healthy aging. But no one has quite put it together the way this program does. This is a walking program for African Americans 55 and older who have lived in the historically black neighborhoods. And what the program does is uh, folks walk three times a week for six months in groups of three on uh, over the course of, I said that, six months, we created over 72 walks, one mile walks in the historically black neighborhoods. And on these walks, uh, at three points along each walk, there are memory markers that pop up. The participants are using a tablet device. And the memory markers are historical images of the neighborhood. Uh, these are images we got from Oregon Historical Society, also from uh, people from the community. 
and they're also accompanied with a few questions. And this gets the people walking and talking about their memories of living and working in the historically black neighborhoods. So what they're doing is they're walking through what is and reflecting on what was. And so hearing this wonderful information, this is all great information, but what this program is also doing is getting the stories from seniors as they're walking through these areas. And that's very different from a one-on-one -on -one, uh, interview. And so this is different from walking tours that I'm sure you're all familiar with, because this is uh, to the benefit of those telling the story. They are doing something for their health. And then ultimately, we will be using the recordings. All of these walks and conversations are recorded. And we will be using these to form community learning sessions where we talk about the link between community health and healthy aging. So taking care and preserving our neighborhood stories, but also taking care of and preserving our elders who have those stories to tell. So we, are, we have information in the back. We have some uh, flyers about the study, as well as some flyers about information sessions coming up. So if you know anybody, or if you are interested in joining the walk, uh, please come find me, or you can put your name on the piece of paper back there. Thank you so much. Is this mic for is this mic for the audience? No, it's for the video. Oh. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Uh, my mother's family lived in Vanport. Mm -hmm. Had to leave because of the flood, and they bought houses next door to each other in the Elliot uh, Boise neighborhood. Who loaned them the money during that time? Who was loaning all these Vanport folks the money to get the houses? That's a good question. A, a number of people, when I looked at. Um... Oh, good question. Good. Yes, of course. Um, this. This gentle lady says that her mother lived in Vanport, and when she, uh, after the flood, she bought a house and some, and her- My mother and grandmother. Her mother and her grandmother, after the flood, bought houses in the Boise neighborhood, or? Next door to each other. Next, next door to each other. Who loaned them the money? You didn't ask? <laughs> <laughs> um, it could be that, uh, they got it on, they bought their house on contract. Uh, well then, uh, you know that it was not on contract? But I have the deed of sale, yes. But it doesn't show the bank? No, nope. but it had a covenant. It said if you buy this house, the only improvement you can make must be at least $500. So, and they bought the house for 7500 so 500 was a huge amount of money, and that was one way they were keeping uh, undesirables from buying houses. Okay, so maybe they had to put a lot of money down. Um, I know that, so I don't know exactly who, who lent to them. I wouldn't be surprised if, if some bankers loaned or if people pulled money from family. If you know that it wasn't on contract, I do know that when I've looked at some of the records at the Urb for urban renewal of the uh, Emanuel Hospital, a number, there's the, the, the records are down at the city archives, and a number of the records for each household that I looked at said that people were buying on contract. Okay, so some of these lenders like Lincoln Loan, people had their own lending companies. Um, the other point I would make is that uh, I do know also that b during the war, a number of people worked and made good money. And housing was crowded, and they saved their money. So it could be that they may have put a lot of money down on the house, because a lot of people, there was pent up demand for housing, and there were a lot of people with money after the war. Because of the rationing, they didn't have, you know, what could they spend their money on? Yes. Uh, so it seems safe to conclude that the city, in collusion with real estate uh, 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 representatives, banks, Portland Development Commission, created blight, which then, by also to withhold... 
You also, I'm sorry, what? By withholding building permits for renovations. Then given the fact that the neighborhood was blighted, that gave them the opportunity to both tear it down and get funding from the federal government for urban renewal. Is, is that safe to say? I think so. I think that is a, a working hypothesis, yeah. And one more question. Some folks at Portland State have said that race had nothing to do with urban renewal and with uh, subsequent gentrification. Would you talk about Portland State's role in what happened with urban renewal and with the you know, connected gentrification? Are you talking about the South Auditorium urban renewal area? No, well, South Alberta, but most, and but Albina. Yeah, I, I, the only thing that I know about Port, Portland State's role, uh, I'm not sure who was saying that race didn't have a, a, a role to play in it. Um, I know that Portland State was part of the first urban renewal area in South Auditorium, uh, down there. And we, you know, had some renovations done on our campus with urban renewal. Um, the other part of your question, and so we benefited, like universities and hospitals across the nation did, okay? Institutions were, were very interested in urban renewal money, especially if they could expand their campuses and keep those blighted areas. The so South Auditorium was an older Jewish, Italian, and, and, and African American, and a very diverse Romani, you know, uh, folks lived in that area. Uh, so a lot of it was class-based, right? Anybody that, you know, a lot of the older people and people with lower incomes. Uh, urban renewal was in part for cities to compete with the sub suburban areas, right? To, they, everybody's chasing the middle class. So what did they do? They tear down older housing and build luxury housing so you can have the middle class come back to the city and live downtown. They built convention centers and and uh, you know, opera houses and those kinds of things. It was a way for the cities to renew themselves and compete. And it was a way for city commercial interests and elites to get, you know, use the federal dollar to, to renew their neighborhoods, redevelop their areas. And, and for many cities, especially large ones like Chicago, it was a way to control the black population, to control the low income population. That's not to say that some of these housing conditions weren't quite bad, but it's the, the interesting part is how um, how uh, you know housing that can, you know is considered it's old you know and some that housing has been revitalized right a lot of the older housing in Albina now is worth more housing more than the housing in other areas so uh, what I will say though about Portland State's role in redevelopment is that uh, Portland State was involved in the Model Cities project and the Portland, with the Portland Development Commission, and there was actually battles between, uh, in the early 70s, between Lynn Musolf, who was a professor in urban studies, if anybody knows him, uh, who went on to work in the, at the Housing Authority. Anyway, he, he had dared to uh, represent in his report that he was writing up on behalf of Albina residents, uh, their claim that the Portland Development Commission was racist and for that, the leader of the Portland Development Commission tried to get him fired and went, you know, went to the top of the university system and tried to get him fired because that was an outrageous and atrocious and shocking thing to be said out loud, which actually is still shocking for some people. But anyway, I hope that answers your question. Uh-huh. Yes. You, you, you. Hi. Uh -huh. um, it was, uh, I, I, I listened with great interest when... Um, you, uh, you quoted from the Reverend Albert Riddle um, of the Church of the Good Shepherd. I looked up on the internet really quickly if that church still exists. It, really? is, um, yes. it does. It moved to 87th Avenue. Um, a two-part question. One, um, was it common for um, communities of faith to simply move with their, um, with their white communities as they left the neighborhood? And two, what evidence do you have of any white pastors standing up for what was clearly an injustice at the time? Um... To answer your second question, I'd have to look. I don't have evidence of white pastors right now, but I'm sure there were, okay? Um, this, you know, was a battle. Uh, and I do think, I, and I don't have specific evidence about Reddick and his church moving out, but I, that wouldn't surprise me. 
So that's about all I can say. I haven't, I haven't really studied the phenomenon about, about church movement, people moving out. Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, you may have covered this and I apologize if I missed it, but when areas were designated as blighted and, and set up for demolition, were people compensated in any way? <coughs> Um, well, I, I see someone shaking their head, no. Is that based on personal experience? Yes. Uh, I understand, you know, I was just looking at a document on, I don't think in Memorial Coliseum they were at all. There were many renters, but there were homeowners there. Uh, in some cases, people were given some compensation for their house, but they didn't have any say over the, over the amount, okay? Uh, and that's a very good question. I know that they had to give, people's houses weren't necessarily, I mean, they were supposed to be paid for their houses, but whether or not they were market rate or could they, they could afford to move and buy a similar house, right? If the area is already disinvested and, and the property values are lower, can they use, is it, can they use it to replace their house? Uh, I was just reading about the recent Emmanuel Hospital kind of renewal or reunion a few years back about that uh, apology that the Emanuel Hospital was making to some of the residents and, and there was that Albina Displaced a per Persons group, I think. Um, Emanuel Displaced Persons Association. Right, thank you. Emanuel Displaced Persons Association. I think it was Thelma Glover who cited in this article who was a resident that loved her home and um, there was some compensation, but there was no choice in the matter. Uh, according to the article, uh, it says that they were giving very little by the city, but that HUD was supposed to be compensating more, something like that. But, but, but for Thelma Glover, it wasn't really about the money. It was about the fact that she had to leave her home, and the one that she found was on a cul-de-sac in Park Rose. So she had to leave her community, so that was you know, a devastating loss to her. Yes, you had your hand up back there and then... Thank you, Dr. Gibson. In your conclusion, you said that uh, we need to rethink the provision of housing in the United States. And I feel like you might have more specifics on what you meant there. Are you willing to share some of those with us? No. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Next. No. Um, well, what I mean is that, I mean, we have a problem with housing provision, uh, as you can see, right? We have gentrification, now we have wave two, three, four, and five. We have a housing crisis in the city of Portland. We have a housing crisis practically on, on the West Coast, period. I'm a native of San Francisco, so I was gentrified out in the 80s. Um, um, in my study of housing, the, you know, people like J.C. Nichols, who are the paragons of the developer community, they're developing for middle and upper class communities. Most housing is developed only for like the top 50% of the population, okay? The theory was that housing for people below that in the economic ladder uh, gets there by trickling down, by filtering down. When the rich people move, then, or the higher income people move, then the housing trickles down. So we never, we allow the private sector to provide, to provision shelter for our entire society. But the private sector does not do it because it's not profitable, similar to healthcare. So I argue that you have to have intervention on behalf of government to provide shelter for everybody. And thank you, thank you. And we did this, we did this during the 30s and 40s, right? With the GI Bill, with the FHA. It was cheaper to move out of New York City and buy that Levittown house on Long Island than it was to stay in the city, okay? It was a, it was a racially biased pro, a procedure, but it helped us get out of I mean, remember, when we went into World War II, we, were, we were, had been in a depression for a long time. The suburbanization project saved, helped, you know, FDR with his New Deal saved capitalism, and then suburbanization grew capitalism, it's, okay, saved capitalism, okay, because the housing market was, was broken, 
not enough housing was being produced. There was a lot of crowding. And so after the war with the baby booming, boomy, boom, <laughs> suburbanization and the auto freeway development, that provided housing and it, it made the home ownership rate, the national rate, the national average go from 44 to 65 percent. Okay, from like 1942 to 1965 or something like that. Okay, so we've done it before. I mean, Levittown was 17,000 houses, okay, built rapidly. We could do it again. But that involved lots of subsidy to the private market. We just have a problem with subsidizing low-income people. Okay, um, you, were you next? I think you were next, yes. Thank you. It, this was just an answer to the, uh, one answer to about compensation with the Emanuel blowdown. Paul Knowles, I did a lot of interviewing in Elliott and, uh, and North. Paul Knowles told me in the long interview that when they took out Paul's cocktails, his bar there, uh, they didn't give him any money whatsoever for the loss of his business. And the excuse was that he, quote unquote, owned another business. He had already opened Geneva's up the street. So they're like, well, Mr. Knowles, you already have a business. And I have to assume that if they could push Paul around, who is a person of some money and charisma, uh, they could push a lot of people around we never heard from. OK, well, uh, thank you for that information. Yeah, I don't know everything about this. So what, uh, when was that? The Emanuel blowdown? Um, well, I, so it was during the Emanuel. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know when Paul's Club had been, yeah. Okay. Okay, did everybody hear her? She said Paul Knowles, who was a, a community leader, did not get compensated when his business was uh, decimated in the Emanuel Hospital Urban Renewal Project. So, yeah, I'm not surprised. And a lot of these interviews um, that people have will be useful for this. Okay, you and then you, yes. I was going to refer to this person. He's had his hand up a while. Oh, okay. Sorry. So uh, I have a two-part question. So we're going to talk about how Paul had a smaller income. Can you speak louder so everybody can hear you? Maybe you could turn around. Um, yeah, so you talked about earlier how Portland had a smaller community of African-Americans compared to other larger cities. Right. I was wondering, did that give African-Americans um, more of an agency within the structure in Portland because of the small community size in comparison, or did it give... Um, the other communities within, like, Detroit and uh, Chicago see more agency within those Good question. Yeah, I would think that, you know, there's different things said. Uh, the small community before the World War II migration uh, of about 2,000 people in the city of Portland, uh, some people felt that they had uh, peaceful relations established, and, and, when, and this happened in cities across the country when black migration came to those cities, there would be, uh, there might be some resentment, okay, on, on, on either side, between the newcomers and the locals, okay, the, the old timers. Uh, but I know that, for example, in that film, Local Color, you have Otto Rutherford, who was uh, second generation, I believe, here, or, you know, here for many, many years, yeah, his father came here. Um, he argued that the uh, influx of, of migrants uh, that added to the African-American community during World War II strengthened them. Yeah, that, that, that it was better to have a larger community. And actually, some of the things I've read are that people from the South who were used to working in so many occupations, they couldn't believe it when they got here during World War II and that they were restricted. Because prior to World War II, African Americans were mainly in service or labor positions, 90% were in service, you know, the railroads or, or domestic service. So they were, you know, unless you were a professional, a lawyer, or a doctor, they were very, very much constrained. So the influx of the population actually did strengthen them. And uh, some attitudes of the newcomer, black newcomers were that, what are you guys doing here? You're so complacent, okay? Um, and they were, you know, the newcomers were shocked at uh, the constraints upon people here. And I think that's why uh, 55, I think the black population here in the 40s declined by 55% between 1940 and, and 1950. People left. 
The NAACP had actually traveled up, at, or was it, no, the Urban League, had traveled up and down the West Coast during the war period, and they issued a report, the West Coast and the Negro, I think around 1944, 1945, just before the war was gonna end. And they, they declared that there would be a number of black communities or a number of places where people would be stranded, that as soon as people were thrown out of war work, they weren't gonna be able to get other, there was gonna be so much competition, they weren't gonna be able to get other work. And actually, put, you know, the mayor of San Francisco, just like the mayor of Portland, wanted these folks to leave, and that there would be stranded populations, okay? Um, I know after the floods in Vanport, the Red Cross, you know, some of the agencies pointed at each other because the Red Cross uh, was told and was giving bus tickets to people to leave uh, Portland. Somebody else had their hand up? I, I, oh, go ahead. Um, I have a question and then I can quickly answer the question about the churches if that's okay. Sure. And I'll just say this will be our last question. Okay. Um, so in terms of the question about churches, um, whether there were white priests, there's a documentary you can access, a KGW documentary made in 67 or 68 called Albina Ghetto State of Mind that actually highlights the work of a white uh, priest in Albina. But you can also go to Cornerstones of Community, which uses data points of addresses from newspapers that follow black owned spaces and that includes churches. Uh, my question to you is, is the mayor or city council or PDC or PBOC or any similar type government organization reaching out to experts like you to inform their future works or, and if they're not, do you think we should be reaching out to them to encourage them to address historians and experts like yourself about how they plan for our city in the future? Well, uh, right now nobody's knocking on my door. Um, I, in fact, I've tried to knock on their door a few times and have, you know, uh, <laughs> not been answered. Um, uh, PDC especially, uh, Mayor Katz, when I was trying to get involved with the Interstate Urban Renewal early on, to be on that initial committee. They weren't interested in somebody with a degree in city planning on that commission. I'm sure there were other degreed people on that commission, but anyway, um, I will say that the uh, who did reach out was the Williams Avenue bike lane debacle fiasco fiasco uh, a few years ago. They did use bleeding albina in their stakeholder committee deliberations, but otherwise, good historians should be used, huh? All right, um, thank you very much. It was fun.